Welcome to our first ever fully animated episode. What is life? With Robert Temple. Hey there, and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're delving into one of the most profound questions in the universe. What is life? Later in the show, we will be talking with Robert Temple, author of A New Science of Heaven. So what is life? That's a tricky question to answer because life can manifest in so many different ways. It's not always easy to pin down exactly what it is. Does it grow, make more little beings like itself, or have the ability to repair its body after a night of indulging in ice cream and Netflix? Well, maybe not the last one. How do we tell the difference? I'm glad you asked. There is no certain answer, but in order to distinguish life from non-life, we can look at what it does. Life reproduces, can repair damage to itself, and usually has some form of movement, whereas non-life just sits around collecting dust. However, there are exceptions, like organs humongous fungus, which covers almost 10 square kilometers or 2,400 acres, making it the largest organism in the world. Yet it doesn't move around a whole lot. <laughs> He's still a fun guy. Then there are viruses, which are not even cells, but rather bits of genetic material wrapped in coats of protein. While they can reproduce and evolve, they can't do anything without a host cell, seeming to be both alive and not alive, kind of like zombies. <sighs> Zombie food! And what about synthetic bacteria, designed by human researchers? They meet many of the criteria for life as we know it. Yet, they are not products of natural evolution, which many researchers hold as a prerequisite for life. Natural evolution. Quite right. Bully. Or, maybe synthetic bacteria are kind of like Frankenstein's monster, alive but not quite normal either. Frankenstein! Good! <coughs> oh, well, uh, excuse me. Oh, oh, right, really, really. I'm a quite decent folk, really. Um, like, uh, come over for tea sometime, then. Crystals can grow and form patterns, but they do not consume material or excrete waste, much less move, and so are not typically classified as living beings. Like crystals, fire a form of plasma can seem alive. But fire doesn't have cells, or genetic material. But could mind-wobbling vast storehouses of plasma, born from energy of powerful young stars within behemoth clouds of gas and dust, be complex enough to network into something you mortals might call life? Next up, we discuss that very question with Robert Temple, the author of A New Science of Heaven. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Robert Temple. His new book, A New Science of Heaven, explores the fascinating question of could plasma be alive? Welcome to the show, Robert. Uh, thanks, James. It's a big thrill to be with you and uh, to watch the aurora behind you. I don't know whether to watch the aurora or you, but I'll choose you. <laughs> the first mistake of video editing, um, <laughs> drawing attention away from the subject. But uh, so first, I'd like to get your origin story. What brought you into science and writing and exploring these big ideas? 
Well, I, I've published a lot of books. Uh, I, I'm a, officially a historian of science and various other things as well. And um, I've always wanted to know the answers to everything ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, I never stopped uh, searching. So I more or less um, come to this business of um, investigating plasma, which mm -hmm. I've been doing for several years now, because I had known um, many of the key scientists um and um and so it's led to my putting all these bits and pieces together to come up with the big answer which is in the book which is that the universe is made of 99.9 percent .9 plasma and not of atoms which is quite different from what we were all told at school so your theme um at the moment is uh what does it mean to be alive and can plasma be alive? And the answer is yes. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a certain type of plasma that can become alive. It has to have dust in it. Dust is very important. Never look down on dust. And, and no problem to dust your books. <laughs> Nebula are always the prettier for dust. <laughs> well, so dusty complex plasmas are a specific type of plasma. But what is plasma in general? It's not made of atoms. What is it made of? It's made of particles, electrons and protons, plus um, ions, I-O-N-S, which are often called incomplete atoms. And the main thing about these particles is that they are charged. Everything's based on electric and, and charged and magnetic fields. So we're talking about electromagnetism here, which is thousands and thousands of times stronger in its force than gravitation. So there's a specific type of plasma called dusty complex plasma, which um, has the ability to self-organize hmm. in the most remarkable way. And this has been proved in the laboratory, which I described very, um, very clearly in the book by the scientists who are on the very leading edge of plasma physics. And they discovered that you have a process called emergence, whereby all kinds of extraordinary uh, attributes of the plasma uh, take shape spontaneously. And that's called self-organization. And they carried this further and they discovered that it even leads to a form of intelligence resembling AI. And that they're therefore alive because they can think. Now, we don't know if they can feel, but we do know that they can think. And, and that means that we're faced, at the very least, with a universe full of AI intelligences, which are inorganic. They're not made of atoms or molecules, they're made of plasma. But surely plasma is pretty boring, isn't it? I mean, isn't it all the same? No. Plasma entities, which is what these uh, things throughout the universe are, and the sun is one of them, because it's entirely made of plasma, and so are all the stars. Um, they um, can um, turn into these um, hyper-intelligent entities and be aware. And the, the, the discovery of the so-called Kordaleski clouds is fundamental to all of this, because the Polish astronomer, whose name is Kordleski, discovered these clouds in 1961. And uh, the Polish government shut him down and said, you stop that, that's naughty. So uh, in 2019, some Hungarian astronomers had another look and they found these clouds and confirmed their existence. Well, now, where, what are these clouds I'm talking about? They're between the Earth and the Moon, but not in a direct line of sight. They're 60 degrees to the right and to the left. They don't emit any light. And you can more or less see through them. But they are together 18 times the size of the Earth. So we're talking about a two cloud system, which used to be known as the Earth Moon system, mm -hmm. which has an Earth and a Moon thrown in for luck. So we've got these two gigantic clouds, which are made of dusty complex plasma which are 18 times the size of the Earth combined. And they're at these two particular points between the Earth and the Moon. Well, what we know now about these types of plasma is that these entities must be intelligent. Well, that's kind of scary, really, because 
there must be so much information stored in these gigantic entities that it would be the whole history of the earth because they are billions of years old they've been around for a while they've been around more than one block so what does it mean to be alive well ask the clouds they know more about it than we do because they've been alive for billions of years that means they have the whole history of the planet stored within them and they are the guardians of the planet now are they friendly I would say they've got to be, because if they weren't, they wouldn't still be here. What do you think, James? <laughs> it's really an interesting idea, and a well, series of ideas, and it, um, it does bring forth a lot of questions. Uh, notably, notably, starting at the most basic, is where do you draw the line between non-alive, not alive, and alive? For instance, if I strike a match I'm, or build a campfire, I'm creating a little bit of plasma. But would you consider that to be alive or does it need to hit a certain level of complexity to cross that line? Absolutely, James. Um, they have to reach a certain level of complexity and they can only do that if they're full of dust. I know that sounds strange, and we don't have time to go into all the details here uh, at the moment. But a dusty complex plasma is a type of plasma, which is nothing like what you get in the center of a candle flame, or even with lightning, uh, or even in your neon light bulbs. It is a particular type of uh, plasma which can only be described mathematically by what are called nonlinear equations. So it's very unpredictable, and you don't know what's going to emerge. But one thing you can be sure of, that if it's around long enough, and if it sustains itself, and it gets its energy from the sun, so because it has to have energy coming in, mm -hmm. it will continue more and more complex. And it will consist of um, a fantastically complex internal structure. So um, there are things called plasmoids, which are blobs of plasma. And they are surrounded by what's called sheaths which are like skin, but they're double layered, very similar to the membranes around living cells. And uh, this means that they are basically on their own. Uh, you can have a, a, a plasmoid full of a very hot plasma, side by side with a plasmoid filled with very cold plasma, but the temperatures will not affect each other because the sheets protect them. And, and so the inside of one of these clouds will be like, um, lots of uh, blobs, plasmoids, connected by limitless filaments. Uh, the, the blobs would effectively be the nodes, and it would be a gigantic electrical machine, really, uh, looking very much like the pictures we see of the human brain and of the cosmic web. Hmm. So interesting. And further, even when we look at animals, or AI, as you mentioned, there's still a lot of question of how we define intelligence. Where do we draw the line for sentience? Um, and so you said that these um, Cordelisky clouds and some others could be considered intelligent. And I'm curious what your basis is for reaching that conclusion? Well, they, they can have spontaneous intelligent behavior. And um, of course, that's just the small ones in the lab have done that. So um, there's, the definition of sentience is something that I don't think that we've solved. Right, that's my it's point, the, right. The right to ask that question, of right. course. Because you're onto this, James. Um, we don't know. Uh, whether they're what we would consider to be sentient. As I said at the beginning, we don't know if they have any feelings. What mm -hmm. that we do know is that it will have complete power and intelligent behavior and response. But whether it would be sentient in the sense that we consider ourselves to be as feeling entities as opposed to merely thinking one, we're talking about the definition of super AI. Nobody knows whether super AI is sentient, and, and that applies also to these gigantic clouds and to the sun and to all the stars. Hmm. 
And what, and, and if you are looking for physical proof or physical evidence of these ideas, I mean, what, what could we look for? I mean, it does, you know, like, you know, when we looked in SETI for biological life, um, you know, we had radio telescopes were, you know, looking for intelligent signals, you know, that did not, non unnatural signals uh, that did not come from Earth. And obviously, if there's a plasma cloud up there swelling up and down, you know, spreading out the digits of pi, <laughs> it's probably uh, it's probably intelligent, but I'm curious what what evidence could be what physical evidence could be out there to support these ideas in the universe. Well, you know, Dan, we have to think about that. My book is the first book to pose this whole thing to the public. Um, every page of the book is new stuff, and and so my job was to bring it to everybody's attention, mm -hmm. give all the answers. Um, Let's sit down and have a talk about it sometime that's longer than this, about what would a good test be. I happen to think that they have attempted to communicate with us and we haven't picked up on that because we're not thinking that way. You see, we have SETI programs and we're listening to little green men on other planets far, far away. But we ha probably have extraterrestrial life on our doorstep between us and the moon. We need to get our thoughts together on this. My book is trying to wake everybody up and say, hey, let's get thinking what this means. I don't have the answers, James. I'm not a prophet and I'm not a guru. I'm, I'm a messenger. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so finally, what, what's next for you in your, in, this, in, in your path of discovering? Well, I've, I've written another book, which is a technical one, because a, a new science of heaven is for the general public. It doesn't have any equations or anything. I've written a more technical one to do with aspects of um, the fundamentals of arithmetic uh, based on the work of uh, Bertrand Russell and Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, and the geometry of von Staub and Klein uh, in order to try to reconfigure our basic conceptions of arithmetic um, and the fundamentals of mathematics, um, which I help with, which I believe would help us to understand this situation better. Because I believe that we have uh, erroneous views in some of those ideas. Hmm. That sounds fascinating. I'll be looking forward to hearing a lot more about your work in the in the near future, Robert. Well, um, I'd be very uh, flattered if you did pay more further attention, James, because you're obviously a very, very sharp guy. And um, your opinion, I think, matters. Thank you so much. And that was uh, Robert Temple. Check out his new book, A New Science of Heaven, available anywhere you get your great science books. Take care. Within the realm of science fiction, we've seen androids and robots like Data from Star Trek or Wall-E from Pixar films that appear much like biological life demonstrating the power of storytelling to explore what it means to be alive. There was also that British robot from those movies with the blonde guy. Generative artificial intelligence, including ChatGPT, has recently made rapid advancements in this field. Some futurists now speculate that machines could soon possess qualities of biological life, raising big philosophical questions about consciousness and sentience, as well as the ethical implications of creating and interacting with non-biological life forms. There are those who argue that artificial intelligence should not be considered alive since machines still rely on human programming to function properly. However, with new technologies allowing computer intelligence to learn from experience, human reinforcement, and massive data sets, it is becoming increasingly difficult to deny them some recognition as living entities. Maybe life is more diverse and mysterious than we can imagine. Perhaps there are forms of life that we can't detect or comprehend with our current tools and theories. Understanding these new forms of life could soon make us question our own existence and place in the universe. Next week, 
we'll be joined by physics professor Nicole Zellner from Albion College as we tell you the stone-cold truth about moon rocks. Make sure to tune in for that episode, coming on April 1st. No kidding. If you enjoyed this week's episode of The Cosmic Companion, be sure to follow, share, subscribe, and tell your friends about the show. You can find us anytime at thecosmiccompanion.net. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. Until next time. Clear skies. <laughs>